In today's show, I give you three time strategies of the busy father. You're going to love this episode with me and Vince Del Monte. Hey, welcome back, everybody, to the Vince Del Monte podcast. We've got a really exciting conversation here with one of my long term mentors, one of my great, great buddies, one of the legends in the game. And for those who don't know Craig, real quick, he helps CEOs, entrepreneurs, actors, high performers from every industry develop clarity, focus, and confidence to grow their business faster and create better work-life balance. Craig has helped many people, including me and many members of my family. It seems like not a day or two goes by that the men we coach don't refer to something that they've read in one of Craig's books, Perfect Day Formula being at the top of the list, or some of his amazing work from Early to Rise or on his podcast. His impact is truly everywhere. So, Craig, you ready to go? Yeah, I'm definitely ready to go, Vince. So awesome to talk to you guys again. Yeah, Craig, you know, I've Adrian here. I've been excited for this conversation. Feels like you're a member of the family. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> oh, man, I, I love hanging around the Del Montes. And, you know, I get a lot of wisdom starting at the top with Papa Luch. Yeah. So, you know, what's, what's interesting is um, you've worked with Vince, my dad, I think my mom, and, and, and I'm just really excited to pick your brain. We want to talk today about this unstoppable mindset. One of my favorite books that you've written. We mm -hmm. want to talk about how parents who want to be exceptional parents, but also highly impactful in their business and how they can do both. So before we dive into those questions, we want to start with this question. We started with all our guests. Can you give us a day in the life um, start the night before and, and then go through a day in the life of the world's most disciplined man. Yeah. So my wife and I, we get our baby to bed around seven o'clock. She does the heavy lifting. I, I make the bottles. She does the feeding. And, uh, after the baby kind of cries herself to sleep, she's eight months old today. And she's, you know, just on the verge of walking and crawling and she can stand up in her crib and she's, she's amazing. Unbelievable, as you guys know. Yeah. And so we get her to bed and then we go to bed pretty soon after we chat and cuddle and just have a conversation about the next day and stuff like that. And I get up uh, today. I got up at 345. I get up without an alarm. So I get up anywhere from 345 to at the latest 440, but usually it's right around four just because I've been getting up at that time for so long. And I go downstairs and I chug some water and I go right to work. So right to work. And then I work till about, well, it depends on when the baby gets up. Baby sleeps from about seven till five, 5.30, six o'clock sometimes. Sometimes we get her back to sleep till 6.30. So I'll work till about six-ish. Um, the way that I have it written down is four to six work, six to eight family time, eight to 11 work, 11 to one workout plus lunch, one to four work and four to eight family time. That's that's essentially it. So I don't want to get too bogged up in the details there, but that's the life. Love it. Love it. Um, I love that you've got six to eight and four to eight as family time just like locked in the schedule. So we're going to get to some of that. Vince is going to dive into our first question, Vinny. Yeah. So Craig, you and I, we go way back. I've, uh, you know, been a product of a lot of your principles as uh, many of your students have. I, I actually consider you ahead of your time, if you will. seems like everybody's kind of preaching a lot of the stuff that you were teaching, heck, 10 plus years ago in uh, your initial masterminds, I'd love for you just to kind of share, um, you know, maybe touch on two or three of your favorite principles, maybe um, ones that have been consistent amongst your top students, you know, some, for me personally, some of the things that have really helped are, you know, the brain dump, end of day brain dump, a priority to do list, uh, magic time, everybody's got their own definition of that these days, but you're the first person I learned it from, the reverse alarm, uh, you remember when you taught me that, trying to shut the day down at four, chilling before before I actually head upstairs. Um, the whole concept of subtraction in order to, um, you know, essentially amplify your life. Um, so many things. Um, consistency is probably one of the things that I've watched from a distance. Like, heck, writing your newsletter for, I don't know what year you're on, maybe 12 plus 15 years now. Yeah, I mean, we started in 2008, that print newsletter, so... It's crazy. 
what are some of your favorite principles that you're just really proud of? Like you're seeing them passed along to your students that you're like, yeah, that's, that's working well for them. Well, that's a great question. And first I want to say, Adrian, one of the things I love most about talking to Vince is that it's almost like he channels this Irish accent and he calls me Krieg. And I love it. I love it. I love the way it sounds. It's so amazing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Krieg. Hey, Krieg, yeah. I got a question for you. It's like, you're, Vince, you're Italian, not Irish, but it sounds amazing. Put your hand into the thing, man. <laughs> yeah. so, so I absolutely love it. And, and I absolutely love uh, spending time with Vince. And I remember, you know, one time I was down in Vince's basement in Toronto, you know, in the, in the legendary garage, uh, or sorry, not the garage, the gym office. And we were just, you know, we were building out this perfect week for Vince, you know, similar to my perfect week formula book. And, you know, essentially it's a seven by seven grid and everybody can use this exact method to kind of build their day. And, and it's very similar to the day that I built, right? There was a two hour block, a two hour block, a three hour block, a two hour block, a three hour block, a four hour block. So if you think about it, your, your days really should be in several blocks not 30 minute time slots. And that's where a lot of people are making a mistake because they are dying a death by a thousand cuts in terms of time transition. So what I learned painfully the hard way and everything that I teach, I've learned painfully the hard way. Every bad habit that you could possibly have, I've had and had to overcome it. And it was the things that I learned in overcoming those that I that, that now teach to people. And so when I was released the first book, Perfect Day Formula, I went on a lot of podcasts. And, you know, when, when somebody says, hey, come on my podcast, or I've got a podcast, come on it, or, you know, I'm doing podcasts, it's like, you know, my shows are like 45 minutes long. Okay, they're 45 minutes long on the calendar. But technically, not technically, um, in my opinion, it's really a 90 minute process. Mm. So there is the there is the 30 minutes before the podcast starts where the transition time and the death by a thousand cuts starts because at 30 minutes before you're like, man, got that podcast in 30 minutes. So now your brain, your CPU, your computer operating system in your brain, it goes from a hundred percent focus on your project that you're working on right now down to about 90 and every five to 10 minutes, knowing that you have to stop the activity transition to another one, drops it by like 10%, 10%, 10%. And you know what happens, or actually it raises it um, 10% because you know instead of you having just one task open in your mind, you have all of these tasks open. And when, you're, when you have multiple tasks open on your computer, it slows down because the computer operating uh, per, uh, processing power is, dec is it's used up all its bandwidth. And so your computer slows down. And it's the same with whenever you have an appointment coming up, it's not just the appointment time mm -hmm. where you actually have the loss of energy and focus. It's far beyond that. And if it's a stressful one, like I know I've been on some big podcasts and it's like, man, I really, you know, I got to perform today. I got to make sure I'm on time there. And then, you, you know, you just, you actually lose a lot of mental energy. So if you have a podcast at nine in the morning and then you're going to go work on a project for an hour and then you're going to go to the gym and then you're going to come back and work on a project for 30 minutes and then you're going to do this for 30 minutes and then you're going to, watch some YouTube videos for 30 minutes. There's so much inefficiency in that. Mm. And so we want to go back to the blocks of time in the two hours in the morning. I'm really just focusing on one thing for two hours. Then I focus on my family to for two hours. Then from eight to 11, I focus on two things. One of those is actually learning Spanish. So mm. uh, I'm, there, I'm actually learning so many. I was talking to my wife yesterday. We had date night. And we were just like, man, we're learning so much. We pro we're we learning more now than we may have learned at any other time since we both left college and university. Like, Because we're learning some, some uh, self, we're taking self-defense uh, three times per week. We are learning Spanish every day and we're raising a baby. We're learning to raise a baby. Like there's so much learning in our lives. So anyways, I learn and then I generate revenue. Uh, in the morning, and then I have my workout and lunch. And then in the afternoon, I do all of my calls. So there is, there is still the transition from call to call, but it's not inserting a call in the morning where there is that loss of time. And so everybody listening, the, there's a lot of rambling here for the most important thing for you to understand is that you must organize your days in blocks of time, 
not by half hour or even hour increments. They must be larger blocks of time. Because one thing I learned, Adrian and Vince, back when I was a struggling personal trainer in 2002, trying to make the jump to online, selling my programs online <clears throat> full time. I was doing it on the side for a long time before that, but I was making the jump full time. And I remember when two of my Thursday afternoon clients moved out of town and I was like, I know that I should, I should keep the afternoon open and work on the online business. And I took a hit, a bit of an income hit, right? You know, it's hundred bucks an hour as a, a trainer in Toronto. And so, you know, I could charge pretty high rates. And it's like, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to lose like a thousand bucks this month by not taking on the uh, replacing those clients. I had, you know, I had a waiting list, but I was like, I'm going to leave those people off. I'm going to take four hours on Thursday afternoon and work on my business. Mm -hmm. And I remember, I remember the day Adrian, because, uh, you know, I was living very close to where you live now in Toronto, in the West end of Toronto in High Park neighborhood. And I remember doing three hours of work and being blown away by how much I got done in a three hour block compared to doing a 30 minute block, six days per week. Yeah. And it was just incredible. And I was like, I got so much done. I went, you know, for a walk into High Park and went grocery shopping. And I went, man, it feels like this just feels so awesome. The weight of the world is off my shoulder. I got so much productivity. And then I just started hacking away at my schedule to get blocks of time. Yeah. And the blocks of time is so important. And so again, don't schedule your day by 30 minute increments. Make sure that you have blocks of time dedicated to most important stuff. And then that's where you figure out your magic time. As Vince mentioned before, magic time is the time of day that you are three times more creative, productive, and energetic. It's the time of day when you're in flow, whatever phraseology, deep work, whatever it is you want to use, it's the time of day when you are best at it. So you guys have young kids. It may be, a, you know, it's been a few years, uh, you know, so maybe I should be talking to your brother, Mikey, about this because, you know, he has <laughs> kids closer to, to my daughter's age. But you all remember when you gave your kids the shape toy, right? Oh, yeah. Block goes into block hole, circle or peg goes into circle hole and so on and so forth. <clears throat> When what, what most people do is all day long, they try and uh, cram the square peg into the round hole, mm. right? They're taking their hardest task and they're doing it at a time of day when they're tired. And, you know, that just doesn't work. Mm. What you need to do is take your hardest task, the one that requires your greatest mental energy and put it into your magic time, which is the square hole. And you put the square peg into the square hole and that uh, alignment makes you more productive. And, that's like, if, if people did nothing else other than identify the magic time, the time of day, the three times more creative, productive, and energetic than any other time of the day, and then did the hardest task at that time and made sure to remove and subtract all distractions from that time block, and then extended that time block for as long as it could possibly be. And if you pretty much did nothing else over the course of the day, other than re reply to a few messages and a little bit of communication, you'd be more productive with that type of approach than you would be with the approach that you probably are taking right now, where you're cramming the square peg into the round hole. Yeah. Craig, there is so much there. Um, I've, I've got a page of notes just on that. So, um, <laughs> I can keep going. <laughs> let me ask you a couple of questions. So never heard the expression death by a thousand cuts. Um, love that idea. Let me ask you, when you think of a larger block of time, one of the things that, you know, as I've listened to your stuff over the years, I always put like an asterisk beside my circumstances as like, well, I got three kids. Must be nice, but I got three kids. Must be. And, you know, I, I always gave myself that excuse. I actually see now that the structure is actually what will allow me to connect with my kids. But I'm curious when you schedule those big blocks of time, larger chunks of time for family time, does it take time to get into flow, into magic time within your family time as well? Like, or can you drop right out of, you know, magic time from uh, in the morning right into your family time? C can you, can you, like, what does magic time in family look like a little bit? That's sort of what I'm curious about. It, it, is, a, it is a great question. And it is, it, it comes down to this mindset that I'm either a professional or I'm an amateur. And... You know, I talk about this magic time, right? And all this stuff. But at the end of the day, a professional, like that's a professional, like tries to do that. They, you know, I'm going to line up my magic time and all that sort of stuff. 
but and this almost sounds kind of contradictory, but if you are a professional, you have to be able to at any time of the day perform at the highest level. Mm. And so if anybody out there is watching this <clears throat> who is into any sport in any possible way, you have to understand that professional athletes play in different time zones at different times of the day, sometimes on back-to-back -back days. And so if the professional is like, well, you know what, listen, I only play my best at seven o'clock central time. And so if, if you want the game to be played, I can't play it at any other time than 7 p.m. central time. Like no one's going to take that excuse, right? Like we expect, you know, insert, you know, famous superhero athlete, you know, LeBron James, Wayne Gretzky, uh, Ronaldo, whatever. We expect that guy, no matter what time zone he played in yesterday or last week, to then show up today and play at his absolute best and deliver a world-class performance no matter what. And so the reason why I bring this up is because that person has a professional mindset. And one of my mentors, this guy named Dan Kennedy said, yeah, listen, we try and get the, the optimal situation for our writing, but if you have to write at 4 p.m. in an airport with all the noise and you're an early bird and it's, or even at seven o'clock at night, like you're a professional, a professional does that. An amateur just finds excuses. Mm. So for me, it's like, I want to be the best person I can be, the best dad I can be. I'm a professional at my job doesn't matter what environment you put me in. Like when I was telling the airport story, I, I've, I've actually stood in lines holding a laptop in one hand and typed articles with the other hand. When I was the, the broke struggling <laughs> personal trainer, when I was a broke struggling personal trainer, I would write, I used to write for men's health magazine. I'd be squished into the subway at 6 PM uh, on a Tuesday night. And you know, if you ever got stuck in that, you know how, crammed people are it's like new york city subway just jam-packed in there and i would be writing up against the back of somebody's head on my blackberry i'd be writing an article for men's health magazine with my thumbs on my blackberry because mm -hmm. i'm a professional and that was the only time i had to do it um and so if if they make you know if lebron's got to fly from cleveland to la to play game seven and and game seven goes until midnight LA time and it's three o'clock back in Cleveland, he still has to play because he's a professional and that's what he signed up to do. And that's what people expect him to do. And if he doesn't do it, people are going to rag on him yeah. and they're going to rag on him either way. Cause he's LeBron, but yeah. that's what we signed up to do. And as fathers, that's what we signed up to do. We yeah. signed up. We, we knew what we were getting ourselves into. Like once you hit the age of 10, you know that babies are difficult and you know that there are a lot of responsibility. And as you become a grown man, you know that getting married is a, is a huge responsibility. But you you signed up in your wedding vows to be there through sickness and health better for worse. I will add that Vince Almani's wedding was the only wedding that I've ever been to where the vows included promises for world domination. And that I don't was... know if you remember... <laughs> Remember that, Adrian. Vince claims not to remember this, but you guys clearly have this on tape. But I'm sitting there and I'm going, did they just, you know, we're sitting there in like Niagara Falls or wherever it was. Did they just say world domination in their yeah. wedding vows? And, I and, was then, like, they, they and did. then they and then they upsold you on top of that, Craig. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> upsold me into an usher dance. Were That's you part right. of the usher I, dance? I was in the usher dance. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You know, Joel Marion, like you, uh, you got Joel Marion to usher dance that was very impressive yeah. so anyways um we signed up for this and yeah. when you sign yeah. up for something whether yeah. you sign up for like the challenges that you guys run or whether you sign up for vince's mastermind or whether you sign up for a marathon like you know what you're getting into mm. and when you sign up for something um it's not difficult you know the difficulty is going to come later on but if you want to be the best father then you need to be able to make that transition very quickly so this, if you need help with the transition, like, man, um, you know, one thing I taught Mike Westerdahl, who's a friend of Vince's and mine, I don't know if, you, have you ever met him, Adrian? No, I don't think so. Okay, so he lives down in Tampa near Joel. And Mike came to one of my events and we were talking about how, you know, he works in the gym all day long in the office at the gym and then goes home and then the kids attack him because they're so excited to see uh, Daddy Westerdahl. 
And he was like, man, sometimes I just, I just can't shut off. And I, so what I taught him to do was, was, Hey, find a song that, you know, you guys were listening to on the drive home from Disney world and you were just sitting in the car and the kids were like maybe exhausted and sleeping in the back and your, your wife was smiling at you and you're like, man, this, this is what it's all about. And it was like, maybe it was, um, you know, maybe it's like Aerosmith or something. Right. So, so you play that song every night on the way home and you channel that energy, you channel right. those feelings, channel that emotion so that when you step in the door, you have, you have transitioned and maybe you have to play it. Maybe after a bad day, you got to play it four times in, in the driveway. Hmm. There's nothing wrong with that because there are days where, where you may need to, you may need to play the entire Aerosmith uh, catalog uh, before you go into the house because it's been a tough day, but you're a professional. And so you go in there and with your mindset, right. For the, so the mindset you have to be able to, you know, it's like, you got different hats on, right? As the old saying goes, you got to be able to put the CEO hat on one second, teacher hat on one second, and then flip that hat off and be, you know, caregiver dad or stern dad or, you know, loving husband or like, listen, that's what we signed up for. Yeah. And, you know, we're all good men listening to this and we all want to get better. And that's just one of the components of us getting better. And, you know, I tell this is knowing that there's been periods in the last week and month and obviously last year where I wasn't as professional as I could have been as a father yeah. and as a husband. And I sit here and, I, and there's just like all these flashbacks, like, man, I dropped the ball, dropped the ball, dropped the ball, um, got the opportunity to improve. And so I will. So obviously no one's going to be perfect. But back to your original question is, there's the mindset shift. So I'm in a, I'm in a spare bedroom. That's where my office is. And as soon as I leave spare bedroom, I'm not working. You know, I leave my phone in this room. Uh, that's one thing that I've really improved on over the last year is I just don't take the phone out yeah. around them. That's huge. Um, huge. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, the thing is just addictive and yeah. it's built to be addictive. And if somebody out there is struggling with the phone, it is not your fault, man. It is, it is the fault of the thousand PhDs from MIT that go to work every day, whose entire job and existence is to make you more addicted to your phone, to your apps, all that sort of stuff. So I don't use any apps uh, as much as I can. And I don't use my phone as much as I can. And you know, I don't even know where my phone is right now, yeah. which yeah. You know, is the key. And so it's, it's the presence. And how can you set yourself up for success? So if you want to have work blocks, you need to set your work block area up so that there are very few distractions. And, you know, I, I challenge everybody to do this little exercise at your workspace and you'll see just how difficult you're making life on yourself. Take your arms out to your side and spin around like a tornado. And anything that you can grab that is in within your workspace is a distraction. It's like a roadside bomb. And so if you have your phone and you have a couple of books piled up that you've been thinking about reading magazines, and you've got maybe the TV remote control is there, you know, like all these things, you have to get those, not just off your desk, but out of your line of sight so that you're not tempted to go and get them, remove them, put them in, in desk drawers, all this stuff, because that sets you up for success. That sets you up for success. And the same when you transition into family time is, um, when you do get into trouble, pay attention. Yeah. yeah. So if your yeah. child says to you, why are you on the phone? Like, oh, uh, I cannot control myself around this thing. So therefore, I will remove it from the equation. I will subtract it. And, and Vince mentioned earlier, I am disciplined through subtraction. I understand the allure of ice baths and some of the benefits and challenges and you know, you got to work out this many times and, and you got to do this and you got to do that. I understand that that can be helpful, but it is far simpler and in my opinion, more effective and more purposeful and more specific to everybody's situation to remove the negative. Mm. Like, for example, you guys are all, were you a runner too, Adrian? No, you bet. I, okay. I beat Vince. I beat Vince once in my life, Craig. Uh. That, I want that on the record here. <laughs> That is some brotherly love. Yeah. So, okay. So imagine I put all three of you guys in a race, right? And I bought Vince, like the best running shoes that are out there right now, like the most lightweight things in the world. And then for your brother, um, Mikey, 
Well, he doesn't need too much help to beat you guys, I'm sure. No, but let's say I gave not. him, <laughs> let's say I gave him like a, a bodysuit or something like, and so both, you know, those shoes and the bodysuit would cut down like a few seconds off the race. And then to Adrian, I put a 50 pound backpack on you. I'm going to lose. You, I'm going to lose, Craig. <laughs> right. Do you see, do you see? And, and so the analogy here is that, yeah, you can go and do ice baths and get a 1.05% uh, increase in performance. And you can go in, you can go and do meditation, which is good, but you know, it'd give you like a 1.3% improvement. Oh, but by the way, you drink four glasses of wine every night. Like that just like that negativity of that, or, you know, you, you watch porn every day, or you, you uh, listen to rap music or you, you know, like bad rap music and you, or you do this or you overeat and you, you like, you know, all these, like whatever negative thing is, the negative is a bigger impact on the performance than any of these incremental positive things like adding a green juice to your life will ever be able to have. And I'm not saying those things are not good. I'm just saying that most people in life, they're not as successful as they want to be. They're not as good of a father as they want to be. They're not as good of a husband as they want to be. They're not as good of a business owner as they want to be because of the things that are pulling them down, as opposed to not having enough of the things that are lifting them up. Yeah. So go and find the things that are pulling you down and remove those through subtraction. Yeah. And without changing anything else in your life, you will have far greater performance, such as when you are in a workspace and you've got your phone beside you, you that's got to change. Yeah. When you're with your kids and you got your phone and you're looking at whatever you're looking at, that's got to change because, you know, behaviors are caught, not taught. And, you know, they're going to be on their phone and not paying attention to you far too soon if, if that's the way you are right now. Yeah. So, so yeah. Craig, let's jump into, um, you're touching on a lot of great stuff and we're talking about how to become unstoppable as a parent, as an entrepreneur. And I think a lot of parents, especially maybe dads, don't appreciate how much emotional capacity you need to have for not just your own stuff going on, but for the emotions of your kids, for your spells and everything else around you. And in order to develop that capacity, we have to make sure that we're not burning ourselves out, which requires us as an entrepreneur to start to embrace one of your key principles of automa uh, automating, delegating, elevating, and eliminating. And this is a new skill, right? Uh, transferring a skill that you've developed to somebody else. Maybe speak to uh, the, the importance of this. This is where a lot of my own coaching students are at. They're doing really well with their own content, with booking calls, with closing calls, with coaching. But now they can't grow because they haven't shifted here. Now they don't have capacity for their families because now they need more capacity to train new people on their team. And it's like, ah, I'm stuck. A lot of people get stuck right here. You know what I'm talking about? So yeah. speak to automating, uh, delegating, eliminating. So your, your job as an entrepreneur is not to hire people and tell them what to do, like top down things. Instead, your job is to find people who are intelligent, show them what you are doing and have them figure out a way to do it better. And then that way you are able to delegate a lot of work to them and they're going to do it in a great way. And then it eliminates a lot of things that are on your plate, which then frees up your time to do so much more great work. Mm. An example of this is my, my last book, The Perfect Week Formula. Um, Vince and I have a friend, Isabel, who was at uh, his wedding. She said, Craig, this is your best book. It's also the only book of the three I did not write. I did not write it because I taught somebody, a young guy named Austin Gillis, to write in my voice. Mm. And then he, and all I did was I downloaded a few audios to him and he wrote the book. So I just gave him stories. He wrote it. Then what Austin did, and this is like one of my favorite things, is Austin taught another guy to write in my voice. 
So the people, so now my, our emails to our list are actually two people. It's two people removed. And, and my mentor, Mark Ford, who I bought the business from, well, once in a while, he'll send me an email because he's on the list. And I'll go, this was really great writing. And I'll go, awesome. I didn't write it. And, and so that's like one of my proudest moments is that there's been this train of delegation through the delivery of skills. So what you need to do is, first of all, you need to, you know, when you're, when you're delegating, whether it's the coaching aspect, whether you're delegating the sales call aspect, whether you're delegating the marketing aspect, the content creation aspect, is you need to give people a model. So you take your best work and you say, here's what I did. Here's why I did it. Then what you do is you have them. Uh, in addition to that, they need to get fundamental skills. So if I was having somebody write the emails and somebody write my captions for my content, I'm, I'm going to get them in a couple of copywriting courses and just make sure that they're a good writer overall. Some people are just going to learn that on their own and then come with those skills and then you just have to refine it. But you're going to take somebody who has the skill set, give them even more fundamentals, get them better at doing the general aspect of it, and then teach them specifically what you're looking for. So here's the, the model of what we're looking for. Now they're going to go and do it. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have the expectation that it's not going to be very good at first, just like any apprenticeship. That's what these are, apprenticeships. So people apprentice to learn how to build houses. Well, the first time somebody squares something when they're building a house, it's not going to be that great. Or when they're trying to level something, it, it's not going to be perfect. Now, over time, they're going to get better at it. But the way that they get better at it is that you give them real-time feedback. Mm -hmm. For example, when Vince was probably teaching Adrian uh, to work out, like, you didn't go and do a workout with Vince. And then at the end of the workout, Vince would say to you, remember in set two on the seventh rep of your preacher curls and you were letting your wrist drop, like, like Adrian would be like, what? I don't remember any of that. What are you talking about? So Vince has to give real time feedback in that rep, in that set. And it's the same with when somebody goes and writes an email for my list when I'm when we're like when I was training Austin, Austin would send me every email and I would send him a video where I would say, okay, let's start with the subject line. Mm -hmm. Here's why this, here's why your subject line was good, or here's why I wouldn't use this subject line. And then first paragraph. Here's these are words I would never say. So if someone who knew my writing was reading this, they would go, Craig didn't write this because he never uses three or four syllable words or whatever it is. Or I would never use this type of phrase, or I would never swear. Um, you know, swear. Yeah, I would never swear. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I never swear. They definitely know it's not me uh, yeah. writing it. And it's like, and then, you know, this was good because. And so it's all this real time feedback. So let's say someone, you know, the trainer out there listening to this is saying, okay, so if I am delegating my caption writing to somebody, I'm going to give them a model of like one of my best pieces of content. I'm going to explain why it was one of my best pieces of content. I'm going to maybe give them a framework. Like, you know, you got to have a catchy opening line. You got to have a good intro. You got to have three bullet points and then you got to have the call to action or maybe a piece of social proof and a call to action. That's the framework you always have to use. And then you've, you, here's a model of, and here's a couple of topic ideas to start with. And the person comes back with a, a piece and then, you know, first of all, you check and make sure the framework was was followed. So you go, okay, great. You followed the framework or you didn't follow the framework. Remember, we're going for three bullet points, not okay. two or not seven. So we always just want to have the three bullet points for now. And maybe we'll change in the future, but right now it's just three bullet points. So let's follow that framework. And then you go through line by line. You, you praise where they've done it right and you correct them and explain why when they've done it wrong. So if they, let's say they score like a 65 out of a hundred, the first time they do it with that feedback, they come back and now they're like a 77 and then they do it again. Now they're like an 83 and then they do it again and you give them feedback and they're like an 89. The next thing you know, they're like every single time they're a nine out of 10 and you don't even have to really worry about it ever again, because now you've got it set up. And what you can also do is, is our friend, Frank Den Blanken, who, who, works with Vince on a lot of things. What he does is he does a video explaining all of this. 
And then what he has his team members do is write out the instructions. So as they write out the instructions, they learn better because instead of just watching the video and trying to remember things, they've actually written down everything that Frank says and put it in numbered itemized order. Mm -hmm. And along the way, maybe they've figured out a way to make it more efficient. They've improved it, but now they have video from Frank and they have a written description of the delegated activity. So that when they're ready to move on to another activity, they can give the, the video and the written part to the next employee to come along and take that over. So yeah. you want to essentially just building a factory. Like, you know, I worked in a factory when I was a kid. I made uh, ball bearings for wheels and in automotive parts, right? So all these people were taught to come in and do the thing. And it's very much like when you're creating a factory in your business, you're teaching people to do the thing with the instructions that if they had to, they could teach another person to do the thing. Yeah, yeah. And they, you know, we're as interchangeable as we can. There's a lot of specialized knowledge in what we do, but as long as people understand the specialized knowledge, they can come in and do the thing. And so that's what we're looking to do as business owners. And no matter what position you're in, like, oh, I'm really busy or, you know, I don't have a lot of money to pay for people. You're like, you don't need a lot of money to delegate stuff. And you can figure out creative ways to get, you know, some of your best customers might want to just be part of the uh, mission that you're on. And so, you know, you go and find these people who have great attitude, you teach them how to do the stuff. And every single business in the world would be capped at, you know, a million dollars in revenue if they didn't automate, delegate and eliminate and build up other team members. So millions of other people have done it. So you can too. Yeah. I love it. Let me, let me ask. I love, I love that. Um, <clears throat> it's like a, a blueprint. Um, I'm wondering if the blueprint can be applied in the family. You've already spoken about eliminate, like literally I'm, I got to go pick up my kids when we're done here and I'm not bringing my phone. I'm just going to leave it in the house. <laughs> There's never an emergency that justifies it anyways, or someone else have a phone. Can you, can you automate or delegate in the family, Craig? Or are those things that you have to, I, I'm, I'm totally like, like are things that to, to create, again, I love this like magic time. Are there things that I can get off my plate so that when I'm with my kids, I can be with my kids? Like, well, it depends here, on what you, what do you mean by that? And, and let me specifically, ask, specifically, what well, are you thinking me, of? Adrian let, Adrian, let me throw something in here too. Because, you know, one of the big things um, that we're trying to do for our families is acts of service. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's an argument to be said that, you know, doing certain things around the house are servicing the family. That's that might be a difficult conversation to have. You know, we have friends, Craig, that would say, oh, you know, that's not in my zone of genius. You know, I'm not going to sure, fold the laundry. Sure. I'm not going to cut the grass. And I get it. You know, there's certain things that or $10, $20 an hour tasks, but uh, maybe to your spouse, um, they're, they, they're way, they're worth way more than $10 mm. or $20 per hour. Yeah, so Adrian, is that where you're going? I think that's an interesting conversation and your thoughts on, you know, certain responsibilities, the fathering, the father, the husband holding, regardless of what, you know, the cost is to maybe doing a high productive task. Well, I, I think you sure. Yeah. Answer that. That's a good question. Answer that one first. So I, th I think this, com this comes down to you making a clear decision around it. Yeah. For example, yeah. Yeah. in, in our house, you know, Michelle cooks more often and I clean up. I like cleaning up, to be honest with you. It's part of my organization, all this stuff. I make all the bottles. I clean all the bottles. Um, you know, I empty the, the, diaper garbage and all that stuff. I, I love changing diapers because, you know, you're cleaning something up and taking a mess and making it organized. Uh, so I, you know, I, and so I contribute a lot as much as possible. That said, we have a nanny all day long who does that stuff so that we can continue to operate our businesses as much as possible. So it's just a clear understanding and, and saying that, you know, maybe sometimes you will fold the laundry or maybe sometimes like, we don't really do. That's not one of the things that matters in our house. We, you know, our housekeeper's doing it right now. So laundry doesn't matter because if, if you think about like acts of service and love languages, there's, so there's acts of service as a general love language, but there are particular acts in the acts of service of all the acts of service you could possibly do, which rank much higher than many of the other acts of service. 
Like, I don't care if somebody cooks me a meal. It's not that important to me. I'm not a foodie. I, I, I just kind of, I like to eat a few things and I don't get, you know, a, a big deal about it. You know, Michelle will make some great meals once in a while, but she's also really busy. So we don't get too hung up on that. And we don't care if somebody else cooks our meals or we order out a lot or whatever it is. So for us, that's not important. However, uh, the morning walk together, that as an act of service is one of the most important things possible. Mm. Me, like, it's it's kind of unwritten rule. If it's if the baby does wake up in the middle of the night, which he hardly does any, anymore, but you know, for the, for the previous three months or so, I don't mind because I don't normally sleep that much. Uh, like, I don't normally sleep like nine hours, and I got to get my nine hours. And if I don't, you know, I'm horrible the next day. No, I wake up in the middle of the night. I got no problem. I wake up in the middle of the night to pee. I'll wake up in the middle of the night to feed the baby. No problem. That's my act of service, so that Michelle can sleep. Um, she t- does t- tend to appreciate sleep more than I do. So that's an act of service that I will always be willing to do. So you just have to figure out and weight things and then make a grown adult decision about where does this fit in? Is this a $10 an hour task that if I delegated it as a $10 an hour task, I would have a thousand dollar an hour problem Mm. with, because this is something that matters more in their eyes. Do they care if I cut the lawn? Do they care? You know, does the wife care if I do this? Like you just have to put everything down in your mind. What matters here? What doesn't? And then you can be selective about it. Yeah. What matters most importantly to me, in my opinion, is consistency for the kids. The kids need to know that you are there consistently. When kids are wondering where you are, when uh, when there's a regular routine and it's broken, that causes you know kids to get a little bit stressed out. And, you know, creating a loving environment, creating an environment in which they can flourish, providing them the emotional support and making sure that they're raised by you and your family. Those are the most important things. Everything else is kind of icing on the cake and can probably be worked out. You know, if, if, you know, like, let's say that you really did think that I should never do the dishes and do the laundry. That is a $10 an hour task. I'd much rather spend that reading uh, to my kids or growing our business. It may be a point of friction in your marriage because you're adamantly opposed to it and your wife is adamantly for it. And, you know, it, it's not going it, to, it's not going to, if that's the only problem, if that's the only major problem, that's not going to dissolve a marriage. And there will be lots of arguments over it. But, it, you know, you do, you're not, you're not doing it out of spite and you're not doing it out of um, <clears throat> laziness or anything. You're just doing it because it's belief for you, that you have. Mm. And in every marriage is always going to be stuff like that. But it, the core fundamentals of being there for the kids and, and supporting them and everything doesn't change. So really what it comes down to is an adult decision about every single one of those things and making the the trade-offs that are necessary in the marriage in the relationship is as there's a million of them and you just have to figure out which ones which ones are worth fighting for yeah it's amazing I, I, it's an amazing answer Greg. it's right uh you cannot automate or or delegate things that matter to your family but everyone's going to have to approach it with adult conversations um, yeah, because it's going to be different. It totally in, is. Totally in is. Many families. Yeah. Before I throw it to mm-hmm. Vince for the last question, one of the things I love in your writing is you talk about making I statements, like make I statements to create a identity. I'm wondering if are there like I do not things that you would say I do not do these things in my family. Things I do not do. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and I think that family rules are really great. Like I do not swear. And I don't really have a problem with people that do swear. I just decided I would not swear. It was like kind of a challenge and, and I just made a habit. And now it's not, you know, neurally, you know, it's not a neural connection for me to swear anymore uh, because I kind of just, you know, got rid of that because I knew I could control it. So I do not swear. I, 
I do not drink. You know, my wife doesn't drink. We just don't drink in this house. You know, if somebody else wants to drink, we're not uh, going to call you out on anything. We just don't. And so having I do not things are, are actually, you know, they're like the, that negative of, you know, the wearing the backpack and getting the negatives out of your life. They're very helpful. And it is also, <clears throat> it also makes a lot of things easier. So up until November of last year, I would drink one drink probably twice a month. And then I went out with a friend of uh, Vincent's and mine, this guy, Jason Capital. And I had one drink with him in California at for dinner. And I had the worst sleep. And I was like, I'm just, what am I doing this for? Like, why am I having one drink? There's no point to it. So I'm just going to stop. And mm -hmm. I remember seeing a few weeks after a quote from somebody said, it's easier to be 100% all in on something than 99% in. And I was like, that describes quitting drinking perfectly. Because if you're the type of person who's like, ah, you know, I, I'm a social drinker, I'll have a drink once in a while. But I try not to. Well, if you try not to, you know, you get badgered into it. But if you if you say, I just don't drink, period, yeah. then now I never, ever, ever, ever will get suckered into having a drink. And, you know, the, the weird thing is, is um, I didn't think of this until after I stopped drinking, like, and, and I, I haven't, you know, I'm not a drinker and driver, or, but people who are the, you know, who say like, I'm a social drinker, I rarely drink. Those are the people who they make one bad mistake and they don't realize, you know, they order one drink and they don't know that the bartender pours them way more alcohol because like, oh, you know, they're out to, they're out for dinner with their buddy and it's the buddy's favorite restaurant. He goes there all the time and you're like, yeah, okay, I'll have a cocktail with you. And, you know, because it's a buddy's favorite restaurant, they always pour the drinks really strong. Unlike most places where they pour them really weak. And then, you know, the guy's like, oh man, I don't really... And he gets pressured into maybe having like even half of another. And the next thing you know, even though he seems and appears as, you know, everybody says totally fine, he gets in his car and, you know, maybe he bumps into another car. And the next thing you know, he's getting the blood alcohol test and he, he blows over. And it's a life changing decision now more than ever. Like 30 years ago, like my father had three drinking and driving uh, charges because this was back in the 80s when the punishment wasn't very severe now it's incredibly severe it is a literally a life-changing job losing proposition for somebody to get caught drinking and driving i never have to worry about that yeah never yeah and i know it's like well, that's kind of an extreme example yeah but i mean that's 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 an extreme example i don't have to worry about so yeah. having yeah. The most important thing is family rules. And when you guys were asking about the family thing, I read a lot about um, like my idea, my reading started off as like, how do we build family wealth that, you know, wealth that carries on for the family after and so on and so forth. Um, and the more you read about family wealth, the more what it is all about is family relationships and family core values and family rules and uh, a family structure where it's almost like a business where there, you know, people are, um, you know, there's annual family meetings. Like there's a really great book by a guy named James Hughes called family wealth, keeping it in the family. And he talks about how there's, there's three different types of family wealth. There's financial wealth, but there's human and intellectual wealth. And so human wealth is just making sure that every human in the family has the opportunity to flourish as much as possible. So, making sure that, you know, they are given the education opportunities, making sure that they are loved, making sure they're taken care of. And then there's the intellectual part, which is, you know, making sure that they are given the opportunity to pursue their academic interests. And that's how a family stays together. And since you guys are Italian, one of my favorite things in the world, and not too many people know this, I've only shown this, uh, I think I've only shown it to Michelle, but there's a picture of the Ferragamo family from I, it, the interesting thing is that you can't tell when the fan, the photo was taken because the clothes they're wearing are so timeless. You're not sure. Is this photo from 1975? Is it from 2005? But it is this giant family, this family run business and the giant family that is in the business that was once started by the grandfather who's passed away. And so it's like the grandmother, 
then her offspring, then their offspring, and even the offspring's offspring. And they're all in this family farm photo. And it's like, to me, that is the thing that I am chasing in life because that is like family to me and family wealth at, of all those things is so important to me. And so I think about that family all the time and, you know, they are Italian. So I figure you guys would, uh, would appreciate that, but, but that is a family that is taking care of its family's intellectual and human capital in addition to its financial capital. And that stuff just fascinates me because I grew up in a situation that was so far from that on at least two of the three levels. So when you don't have like, like it's this little fantasy thing to me uh, that I've been chasing. So anyways, I just wanted to recommend that book. And I think you guys will get a lot out of it because even though it's about keeping your family money, it's about far more than that. And that's what I wasn't sure if you were asking about that type of stuff at the start, but it's, it shows how you actually build like a family structure with meetings and, and voting and all this stuff um, around your core values. Yeah. I, I love, love it. it. Well, yeah, it's, it's actually like like another one that's uh, it's kind of like the godfather family but like the legal the legal version of it you know yeah. it sounds a lot like the mafia yeah yeah <laughs> once you're in you don't leave yeah right. but craig, craig just uh you know last question i love what you're saying too about the rules of subtraction that no drinking um our dad says it like this i don't know where he got it but first you make your decisions and then your decisions make you and I really like that you're living a, a life of design, not a life of default. So let's end with legacy. And, uh, you know, our men, uh, our program, Men of Bedrock, is meant for parents. And, you know, you've had so much exposure to great entrepreneurial parents. Um, you might have just answered the question, what you were just sharing. Um, you've also had so much exposure to great books. For, between the books, between all the great people in your life, who I know you've been open to feedback. That's one thing I've one of many things I've always admired about you, you're, you're taking notes. I noticed that before you, uh, before you had your family. And um, I guess my last question here is, where are you going to carve your own path uh, when it comes to um, your own parenting? So and with terms of the legacy stuff, like to me, the one of the most important things is freedom. So we want our family, like, so we have five core values and hopefully I can remember them all, but uh, it's love, honesty, freedom. Um, what the heck is the, the one of the, there's two other ones. <laughs> I can't think of them right now, but one of them is like intellectual curiosity. Mm -hmm. And then there's another one, which I can't remember. So, you know, so our children, our legacy to our children is like, we encourage you to question things. We encourage you to um, pursue the things you love, but you must, uh, personal responsibility is the other one. So you must have personal responsibility. You understand that whatever action you take has consequences. So if you want to be an artist and you want to pursue that, you have to understand that the consequences of being an artist are that you may not have a lot of money and you may not be able to afford material things. So understand that, but you will have uh, unconditional love from us and you will always have honesty from us and you, you can pursue your intellectual curiosity. So like that's our legacy around our core values. And so we're raising our kids to do that. And we're also pursuing a life of freedom to make sure that, um, you know, we're not being forced into doing something as uh, that we don't want to do that, you know, people in the past have had to do. So that's the type of approach that we take to, to our family and to our future and in terms of the parenting that I will do is I do plan on homeschooling um, my daughter and our, hopefully our future children that we uh, plan to have uh, because I just, I think that the, um, I don't know, like some people call it unschooling and stuff like that. The, that approach where they have the opportunity to learn in different environments is really beneficial. Like our friend Isabel Price, she's been homeschooling her kids for a long time. They're really well adjusted. They keep close to the family. She gets, you know, 
they're they're doing like high school stuff and they're like late high school stuff and they're 13. So I like the ability to like accelerate them faster in the areas that they choose to be. And I remember when I was a kid, so I grew up in the eighties, right? So, you know, I grew up when you didn't have to wear a seatbelt at age four and you could sit in the front seat of a car, right? You can't do that now. But my dad would also take me out of school once in a while. And I would, cause he, he was a farmer and he would take me to the stockyards and he would buy and sell cattle and, you know, I would watch this and then he would teach me about cattle and he would introduce me to all these like crazy characters there. And it's like, you know, there was a, there's a lot of education in that. And I think that that's the type of education I want to provide my child while still making them smart as heck, according to regular school standards. And then they can, you know, join all these after school programs like sports and whatever the, the heck the kid is into. Um, so that's, that's the way that I'm going to do things. And I think that it is having me more in charge of my child's intellectual capital makes me a little bit more comfortable. Craig, I, I love it. I, I, as I'm listening to you, I'm, I'm just watching you almost like <clears throat> ponder, like just like the choices you make you know they will have big impact and so you're like careful and intentional about them so thank you for this thank you for being here uh real quick where can people find you they can find me on instagram at real craig valentine so real craig valentine instagram or um you can get my my books all my books for free no opt-in required nothing uh you can get the digital and audio books for uh, craigvalentine.com forward slash free books. I wrote my books to be read. So that's why I give them away for free. And if someone's going to start with one of them, start with the perfect week formula. That is the most important book that I've read. It's the most practical, have the most impact. Uh, I didn't actually write it. So that's probably another reason <laughs> that you should actually start with it. Uh, and, and I have taught those principles to Vince in his basement, drawn out a perfect week calendar for him. And, uh, so, you know, you know, that the hosts of this are putting this into place. Oh, yeah. And there's, one, and there's one more place where they can find you in person, in person, in the flesh, January 19th to 21st, Craig Valentine is going to be speaking and bringing the thunder and sharing his best practices for everything we've been talking about today, strategy systems, team performance, everything, marketing sales and stuff that, that we didn't cover today. Uh, in Cancun, I can't wait to see you, buddy. So uh, stay I'm tuned so excited for, more for it, man. I'm, on know, so one of the things that Michelle and I do down here is we try and go to a different hotel every weekend. Um, we you know we test them out, but we also you know like if we're gonna live in Cancun, we may as well be on vacation every week, if not every day. And so we went to the hotel where you're having your event, and it is a Grand Slam winner, one of our favorites over there. So it's really fantastic. It's great. Sweet. That's awesome. Great to hear. We got an all-inclusive package, so uh, you won't be, uh, oh, in all yard, you know, so that'll be good. It's going to be a good time. All right. Love it, dude. Love it. And maybe I'll see you guys when I come back to Toronto at Christmas time. Yeah, man. That's right. I hope That'd so. be fantastic. Yeah. Let's do it. Well, hey guys, this is your turn to pay it forward and to share this podcast with a friend or on your socials. You know what to do. Tag me at Vince Dalmani, at Men of Bedrock, at Real Craig Valentine. Tag us. We'll reshare so more people hear these good words of uh, inspiration and living today. Have a great day, everybody.